Welcome back. In the previous video, we saw how um, the zygote, or first how the egg becomes the zygote, and then how the zygote becomes um, the morula via the process of cleavage. So at the end of cleavage, we have a morula, which is um, generally regarded as um, the 16th cell stage. So one cell, the zygote, has divided several times to become 16 cells, which we call the morula. So what happens to the morula is gastrulation, sorry, blastulation. But before blastulation, I said before that um, <coughs> cleavage could be holoblastic or meroblastic. And I said that each of them had patterns. So what I've put here is um, some examples of organisms that undergo each of those types of cleavage as well as the specific pattern. Like here, it shows that mammals undergo holoblastic cleavage. Now, if you really listened in to that first video, if you really listened to the things I said in that video, you realize that for mammals to undergo rotational holoblastic cleavage, it means that the egg of a mammal is not macrolecithal because for macrolecithal eggs, the type of cleavage that would occur is meroblastic. So all of these organisms that we're seeing here undergoing holoblastic cleavage do not have eggs that are macrolecithal. Either their eggs are micro or, um, you know, oligo or mesolecithal. Like in the case of um, humans, our eggs are usually microlecithal. The um, yolk content is very little. And because the yolk content is very little, unlike the yolk of um, a chick that's um, a bird, if you compare reproduction in the two, see the interesting thing you find. When a bird lays an egg, like the domestic fowl, when it lays an egg, that egg contains plenty yolk. And that yolk is enough to sustain the developing embryo throughout the period of development until it hatches to become um, you know, a living organism as it were. So throughout the process of development, all the nourishment it will get comes from the plenty yolk that the egg contains. But in the case of humans, our yolk contains, or sorry, our eggs now contain little yolk, very little yolk. That's why within that one week or thereabout period where all of these processes I've been describing take place, the uh, morula needs to find its way to the uterus and get implanted there. Why does implantation need to occur early? Because the yolk finishes in no time and the developing embryo needs to get nourishment from the mother. You understand? So that's the reason implantation has to take place early so that yolk gets exhausted but the embryo is still able to survive. By the way, once implantation takes place, what you have there is called an embryo. Okay, so having said that, let's come back to this. So what we have here is the morula. Let me just put an M there. So this is the morula. And then this is B. B stands for blastulation. And then what you have here is B or this other B. So the question now is, what do the Bs and the M stand for? I've already told us that the M is a morula. Now, a morula is a compact mass of cells, usually no space in between. But once there comes to be a hollow, a cavity in the morula like this, its name changes from morula to blastula. So the blastula is a morula that has acquired a cavity. Once that cavity joins the morula, we say it has become a blastula. But in humans, sorry, in mammals now, not just humans, so it's a general thing for mammals. In mammals, the blastula is called blastocyst. So just in case you're wondering the difference between blastula and blastocyst, blastula is the general term, but the blastula in mammals is called blastocyst. What is more, the blastocyst in mammals does not exactly have the same appearance and the same features as the blastula in organisms generally. Now see an important difference. In the case of the blastula as well as the blastocyst, there's a cavity, so that's a similarity, and that cavity is called blastocyl. Blastocyl, 
So blastocyst is the name of the cavity. But in the case of the blastula, these cells that you see form a ring there. Each of them is called a blastomere. Each of those cells is called blastomere. And everything all around, that whole mass of cells surrounding the cavity there is called blastoderm. Blastoderm. However, in the case of the blastocyst, you don't have just an outer cell mass like this. You know, this is just an outer cell mass with a cavity. In the case of the blastocyst, there is an outer cell mass. Then there is also an inner cell mass, which is where I'm touching now, and then the cavity. So in the case of the blastocyst, this outer cell mass is called the trophoblast, and that is what will become the placenta in the long run. Whereas the inner cell mass is called embryoblast. Embryoblast. And that is what forms the embryo at the end of the day. So we have embryoblast, which is inner cell mass, and then trophoblast, which is outer cell mass. Those are only present in a blastocyst, which is the blastular form of mammals. Whereas in the general blastula, the two parts we have are blastocyl, the cavity, and blastoderm, the cell mass, which is made up of individual cells called blastomere. Okay, so we've said now that this process 3, which is blastulation, simply involves the morula acquiring a cavity. Once the cavity comes, we say blastulation is complete. So beyond blastulation, what comes? Gastrulation. What does gastrulation involve? Gastrulation is where we now have the blastula or blastocyst differentiating into which means gastrulation involves the blastula, which is two cell masses, dividing to become or differentiating or becoming modified to form the ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. And usually, these three layers, like I said, would usually come from the embryoblast portion of the uh, blastocyst. So from the embryoblast portion, you have three layers differentiating. And once those three layers have come out, or in some organisms, diploblastic organisms, only two layers, we say that gastrulation is complete. The main thing that then follows this gastrulation is the formation of the organs. So at this point, it's important that you know the organs that arise from the ectoderm, the organs that arise from the um, mesoderm, and then the organs that arise from the uh, endoderm. It's very important because it is high yield in exams. So what organs, what structures come from these three germ layers? We have that here. The ectoderm, which is the outer layer, forms NS, that's the nervous system. So the nervous system comes from the ectoderm, or we say that the nervous system is ectodermal in origin. Then beyond the nervous system, we also have the um, epidermis, and then epidermal structures. So it's easy to remember, the epidermis is on the outside, so epidermis comes from ectoderm, and then epidermal structures like hair, like sweat glands, and sebaceous glands, mammary glands, all of them are regarded as epidermal structures and all of them come from ectoderm. Then beyond those ones, the enamel too. If you think of where enamel is, it's the outer covering of a tooth. It is also ectodermal in origin. And then the lining of the mouth and the nose. So the epithelial lining of the mouth and of the nose all come from ectoderm. Then for mesoderm, we have the notochord, which is um, the equivalent of the backbone that we talk about for vertebrates. And then you also have the um, dermis. The dermis is the true skin, which lies below the epidermis. And if you really look at it, if you look at the way the dermis is located below the epidermis. So yes, mesoderm inside the ectoderm, stuff like that. Then beyond the dermis, you have um, the involuntary muscles of the digestive system. So the muscles we have in our digestive tract that um, are not under our control, involuntary muscles, they are also mesodermal in origin. Then here I've put rex. What rex 
a mnemonic stands for is the um, reproductive system and then you have the excretory system you have the circulatory system and then s is skeletal system or musculoskeletal system so things like muscle um, bone cartilage uh, connective tissues generally they come from the uh, mesoderm they are all mesodermal in origin and then for the endoderm just before i talk about endoderm of course we know that there are four main types of tissues connective tissues muscular tissues epithelial tissue and nervous tissue connective tissues and muscular tissues from what we said here are mesodermal in origin nervous tissue nervous system ectodermal in origin then for epithelial tissues we say they are the typical tissues they arise from all the three germ layers so if you are asked from which germ layer do epithelial tissues come the answer would be from all three germ layers what about nervous tissue ectoderm what about connective and muscular they are from mesoderm in other words, it means that the only tissue type that comes from endoderm is epithelial tissue. Then, what do we have coming from the endoderm apart from epithelial tissues? We have um, the pharynx, we have the mid-ear, so middle ear actually. You know, the ear has the outer, middle and inner portion. So the middle ear is from the endoderm. Then we have um, the thymus, the thyroid. The thymus is different from the thyroid. The thymus is found in the mediastinal area here, that is uh, between the lungs and above the heart. You have the thymus there. Then you have the thyroid, you have the parathyroids. And then the liver and pancreas, yes, organs that are associated with the digestive tract are also endodermal in origin. Then the lining of the respiratory system is from the endoderm as well. And then the bladder, the urethra, some other reproductive structures are also from endoderm. Then importantly, the lining of the entire digestive tract. You see, there's a difference between the muscles of the digestive system, the muscles in the digestive tract, those ones are mesodermal in origin, but the epithelium, the epithelial lining of the digestive tract is endodermal in origin, the whole of the digestive tract, except the mouth and the anus. So these are structures that arise from ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. You may want to take some time to note them just in case you see them in an exam. So that's the module we'll take under fertilization and organogenesis. The next video that would be uploaded would be a video on epithelial tissues. So we'll talk about the types of epithelium, we'll talk about covering epithelium, and we'll talk about glandular epithelium. Again, I expect that um, that may take up to two videos, but I'll make the videos available soon, and it's my hope that you watch them. It's also my hope that you enjoyed this one, so I'll see you in the next video. Remember to subscribe, remember to like, and remember to share. Thank you.